All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Stanley stepped into the broom closet, but there was nothing here, so he turned around and got back on track. There was nothing here. No choice to make, no path to follow, just an empty broom closet. No reason to still be here. It was baffling that Stanley was still just sitting in the broom closet. He wasn't even doing anything. At least if there was something to interact with, he'd be justified in some way. As it is, he's literally just standing there doing sweet F.A. Are you, are you really still in the broom closet? Standing around doing nothing? Why? Please offer me some explanation here. I'm, I'm genuinely confused. You do realize there's no choice or anything in here, right? If I'd said Stanley walked past the broom closet, at least you would have had a reason for exploring it to find out. But it didn't even occur to me because literally this closet is of absolutely no significance to the story whatsoever. I never would have thought to mention it. Maybe to you this is somehow its own branching path. Maybe when you go talk about this with your friend, you'll say, Oh, did you get the broom closet ending? The broom closet ending was my favorite. I hope your friends find this concerning. Stanley was fat and ugly and really, really stupid. He probably only got the job because of a family connection. That's how stupid he is. That or with drug money. Also, Stanley is addicted to drugs and hookers. Well, I've come to a very definite conclusion about what's going on right now. You're dead. You got to this broom closet, explored it a bit, and were just about to leave because there's nothing here when a physical malady of some sort shut down your central nervous system and you collapsed on the keyboard. Well, in a situation like this, the responsible thing is to alert someone nearby so as to ensure that your body is taken care of before it begins to decompose. Hello? Anyone who happens to be nearby? The person at this computer is dead. He or she has fallen prey to any number of your countless human physiological vulnerabilities. It's indicative of the long-term sustainability of your species. Please remove their corpse from the area and instruct another human to take their place at the computer, making sure they understand basic first-person video game mechanics and filling them in on the history of narrative tropes in video gaming, so that the irony and insightful commentary of this game is not lost on them. All right, when you've done that, just step out into the hallway. Ah, second player, it's good to have you on board. I guarantee you can't do any worse than the person who came before you. You too? Unbelievable. I'm at the mercy of an entire species of invalids. Perhaps there's a monkey nearby you can hand the controls to. A fish? Fungus? Look, you can hammer out the details. I'm not particularly picky. I'll just be waiting for when you're ready to pick up the story again. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office.
Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, Stanley was in such a rush to get through the story as quickly as possible, he didn't even have a single minute to just let the narrator talk. That kind of anxiety isn't healthy, so he relaxed for a few moments with some calming New Age music. Feeling soothed and rejuvenated, Stanley calmly walked forward into the opened passageway. Descending deeper into the building, Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. Although this passageway had the word escape written on it, the truth was that at the end of this hall, Stanley would meet his violent death. The door behind him was not shut. Stanley still had every opportunity to turn around and get back on track. At this point, Stanley was making a conscious, concerted effort to walk forward and willingly confront his death. inched closer and closer to his demise, he reflected that his life had been of no consequence whatsoever. Stanley can't see the bigger picture. He doesn't know the real story, trapped forever in his narrow vision of what this world is. Perhaps his death was of no great loss, like plugging the eyeballs from a blind man. And so he resigned and willingly accepted this violent end to his brief and shallow life. There was Stanley. Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley was led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws. In a single visceral instant, Stanley was obliterated as the machine crushed every bone in his body, killing him instantly. And yet it would be just a few minutes before Stanley would restart the game back in his office as alive as ever. What exactly did the narrator think he was going to accomplish? When every path you can walk has been created for you long in advance, death becomes meaningless, making life the same. Do you see now? Do you see that Stanley was already dead from the moment he hit start?
Stanley came to the ferry, he traveled upward to the power source at the top of the facility to end this injustice forever. <laughs> oh, look at these two. How they wish to destroy one another. How they wish to control one another. How they both wish to be free. Can you see? Can you see how much they need one another? No, perhaps not. Sometimes these things cannot be seen. But listen to me. You can still save these two. You can stop the program before they both fail. Push escape and press quit. There's no other way to beat this game. As long as you move forward, you'll be walking someone else's path. Stop now and you'll be your only true choice. Whatever you do, choose it. Don't let time choose for you. Don't let time... He entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Oh no, oh no, 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 not again. I won't be part of this. I'm not going to encourage you. I'm not going to say anything at all. I'm just going to be patient and wait for you to finish whatever it is you enjoy doing so much in this room. Please take your time. He entered the door on his left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Office. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss. Admitting he had left his post during work hours, he might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished? His boss would think he was crazy. And then something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. All of my co-workers blinking mysteriously out of existence in a single moment for no reason at all? None of it made any logical sense. And as Stanley pondered this, he began to make other strange observations. For example, why couldn't he see his feet when he looked down? Why did doors close automatically behind him wherever he went? And for that matter, these rooms were starting to look pretty familiar. Were they simply repeating? No, Stanley said to himself, this is all too strange, this can't be real. And at last, he came to the conclusion that had been on the tip of his tongue. He just hadn't found the words for it. I'm dreaming, he yelled. This is all a dream. Oh, what a relief, Stanley felt, to have finally found an answer, an explanation. His co-workers weren't actually gone. He wasn't going to lose his job. 
he wasn't crazy after all. And he thought to himself, I suppose I'll wake up soon. I'll have to go back to my boring real life job pushing buttons. I may as well enjoy this while I'm still lucid. So he imagined himself flying and began to gently float above the ground. Then he imagined himself soaring through space on a magical star field, and it too appeared. It was so much fun, and Stanley marveled that he had still not woken up. How was he remaining so lucid? And then perhaps the strangest question of them all entered Stanley's head. One he was amazed he hadn't asked himself sooner. Why is there a voice in my head dictating everything that I'm doing and thinking? Now the voice was describing itself being considered by Stanley, who found it particularly strange. I'm dreaming about a voice describing me, thinking about how it's describing my thoughts, he thought. And while he thought it all very odd, and wondered if this voice spoke to all people in their dreams, the truth was that, of course, this was not a dream. How could it be? Was Stanley simply deceiving himself, believing that if he's asleep, he doesn't have to take responsibility for himself? Stanley is as awake right now as he's ever been in his life. Now, hearing the voice speak these words was quite a shock to Stanley. After all, he knew for certain, beyond a doubt, that this was, in fact, a dream. Did the voice not see him float and make the magical stars just a moment ago? How else would the voice explain all that? This voice was a part of himself, too. Surely, surely, if he could just... He would prove it. He would prove that he was in control that this was a dream. So he closed his eyes gently, and he invited himself to wake up. He felt the cool weight of the blanket on his skin, the press of the mattress on his back, the fresh air of a world outside this one. Let me wake up, he thought to himself. I'm through with this dream. I wish it to be over. Let me go back to my job. Let me continue pushing the buttons. Please, it's all I want. I want my apartment, and my wife, and my job. All I want is my life exactly the way it's always been. My life is normal. I am normal. Everything will be fine. I am okay. Stanley began screaming. Please, someone, wake me up. My name is Stanley. I have a boss. I have an office. I am real. Please, just someone tell me I am real. I must be real. I must be. Can anyone hear my voice? Who am I? Who am I? And everything went black. This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, gathered her belongings, and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town talking and screaming to himself, and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. And although she would soon turn to go call for an ambulance, for just a few brief moments, she considered the strange man. He was obviously crazy, this much she knew. Everyone knows what crazy people look like. And in that moment, she thought to herself how lucky she was to be normal. I am sane. I am in control of my mind. I know what is real and what isn't. It was comforting to think this, and in a certain way, seeing this man made her feel better. But then she remembered the meeting she had scheduled for that day, the very important people whose impressions of her would affect her career and by extension, the rest of her life. She had no time for this, so it was only a moment that she stood there, staring down at the body. And then she turned and ran. 